This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning Charles Hugh Smith, well-recognized writer on the web who is the publisher of the website of two minds.com. Good morning, Charles. Welcome back to Macro Analytics. Thank you, Gordon. Glad to be here. Charles, today we're going to talk about your new book, The Nearly Free University and the Emerging Economy. Charles, how many books is this now that you've written? Uh, this is actually my seventh uh, nonfiction book. And then there's some fiction books too? Yeah, there's a seven, seven novels as well. Seven novels, okay. Because I'm starting to lose track of the nonfiction ones. Charles, could you just give our listeners a brief overview of what this book is about? Well, Gordon, the the book is um, a critique of the current uh, system of higher education, and uh, from my perspective, um, higher education is in a crisis uh, that it's a diminishing returns. The costs are rising, but the um, the yield on that education in terms of, of usable education is declining. And uh, we need to reconnect higher education with what I call the emerging economy, the parts of the economy that are growing and flourishing. Charles, I know you've got some slides to take us through this and really highlight this message, but I'm, I'm really glad we have the opportunity this morning to discuss the book because it's my longstanding personal opinion that education in the U.S., has at its core at least four central structural problems. And we've kind of talked about those before. The educational system model, to me, is wrong. The U.S. culture regarding educational expectations is wrong. Educational funding for specific training, which you're indicating too, is inappropriate and wrong. And the financing infrastructure is on a path towards collapse, in my mind, as $100 billion of at least of student loans will soon be defaulting in waves, which is obviously, I believe, also wrong. I would lay all at the, at the foot of public policy that that is what we've got in error. And these problems are huge problems, and it really comes out in some of the slides that you brought this morning. Comment on that? My comments? I think you've uh, summarized uh, the, the structural problems that uh, we need to fix. And what's um, what's positive is they are fixable. Without question. Yeah. The biggest problem, like everything, seems to be the real identification of the problem so that people can clearly understand it and grasp it, at least our po po public policy makers. And then second, being able to get through the political gridlock to actually get it into some kind of actionable form. I don't know which is more difficult nowadays. Yeah, and I hope we can um, clarify for, for students and parents um, a, a way through the thicket, you know, that uh, we can identify how, how to get a useful higher education. Let's jump right into the slides here. Charles, and then, and then kind of build on the comments we just uh, we just made, if we could. The key point of these slides is to show that the cost of, of college, uh, you know, university tuition and fees is skyrocketing completely out of proportion with the rest of the economy. Um, and this chart shows, uh, compares tuition with, with medical care, which is also completely out of control, but it's actually double. <laughs> The, the, the skyrocketing costs. And with a disposable income being crushed for middle class in North America, these two items going at this rate is crippling. And 15 years ago, education was considered expensive. Now, I, everybody I talk to that have got kids in college, it's a decision about how they, the parents, are even going to be able to retire. And with pensions now being removed, it's a shock. And so the educational burden on them is orders of magnitude greater than any other generation experience. And it's not just because of this absolute cost. It's, it's in relationship to disposable income. Exactly. The um, I think it's clear that we're in a diminishing return situation here where the cost of, of college is rising, the, the student loan burden is rising, and yet in, in measured in terms of employability or in terms of income, 
the yield on higher education in America is declining. You know, you, your job opportunities are, are, are less and your earnings are, are lower. And so I, this chart is um, what I call the fatal disease of the status quo, which is to get the same yield, the costs are skyrocketing. Or if you keep the cost uh, status the same, your yield plummets to near zero. So you're not getting anything for this enormous investment in higher education. And um, just to remind readers who, who don't have kids in college, Forty to fifty thousand a year is is um, absolutely standard, whether it's a private uh, s- a college or uh, a top tier uh, public university. And so you're talking about one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand um, dollars. And we can see here that the federal government has tried to paper over this um, uh, skyrocketing of costs by by uh, issuing and backing student loans to an unprecedented degree. And these um, these charts of student loans uh, created by the federal government are a classic, uh, you know, hockey stick. Um, and is this is this healthy or a wise public policy to be generating um, upwards of a trillion dollars in student loans for uh, largely worthless education? Obviously not. Especially when you understand the other thing that's changed dramatically. You graduate and you have this education and there's no jobs. So, and, and, and the jobs that the, the students are finding are in a new category called interns. That is, get experience but no pay. I don't know how many parents that I know have their kids employed but as interns and are making no money or at best part-time kind of wages as they build up their CV. This is a new direction we've never seen before, too. So their ability to pay back this debt whether the students or the parents who feel generally a lot of cases obligated equally, it's not there. They just can't pay it back because it's immediately pay and due the moment you graduate, right? And it's a non, yes. it's, there's no recourse. It, they can garnish your wages. It's a huge problem that's compounding itself because of your one, the magnitude of the debt. And then second, the inabilities to actually f- pay for it when it comes due. Yes, that's a critical point. The, the ability to uh, pay for this enormous expense is, is declining. And I think we, we need to be really honest about um, the fact that only the top 10% of the workforce is doing well in terms of maintaining their disposable income. And of course, about of that 10%, approximately 5% of the workforce is professionals, doctors, attorneys, um, professors, uh, you know, the very, uh, the top tier um, of our managerial economy. And then there's another 5% of managers, entrepreneurs. But the bottom 90% are not doing well. And uh, given the fact that 40% of the workforce has a college degree, then clearly we're failing uh, roughly a third of, of the entire uh, workforce here that we're promising them, um, you know, good paying, secure jobs that simply don't exist. And that's, that's criminal. Charles, how does your book address this? I start by looking at um, the, how higher education in the U.S. is a legacy system with roots that go back to the ancient world. And, of course, uh, back in those days, uh, paper was extremely scarce and very expensive. And so there were very few books, and the books would be assembled in a very few libraries. And so and, and the process of teaching was um, very easy. S- a, 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 an instructor read this very rare text to a congregation of students. And so that model has um, is still present. We still congregate these students in these huge campuses around a library, and we still rely on an oral lecture. But the technology um, of our present era has completely bypassed this legacy system. Now, any tablet, any laptop, any smartphone is a library, and it's a source of, of um of oral lectures. You can watch um, lectures on YouTube. So the, the, the enormous expense of the legacy system is um, completely, uh, it's, it's out of touch with, with technology. There's, there's simply no reason to have this legacy system. And the, if you want to use an oral lecture, then what technology enables is the best and the best of the best oral lectures that can be distributed to, you know, 10 million people rather than Ninety-five um, percent mediocre lecturers distributed around in, in thousands of campuses. Springboards from the fact that the university model itself is flawed in that it's based on research. 
And so your professors that were always there, or been there have, have had to publish. They've had to write. That's how, and that builds the reputation of the university. It attracts research monies in or grants for postgraduate students. And that's, that's the funding mechanism. So tuition money is not necessarily and has never been truly focused at delivering education. It's been delivered at the mechanics that would fund more research, which would grow more money. Now, as more people started going to universities, the universities started saying, ah, the enrollments will give us more money. But the, the research and the education need to be separate, completely split apart, but it's not done that way. And now with corporations themselves not willing to spend as much money on pure research and pure academics, the money's not flowing in for the research, which is putting a bigger drain. That's why these costs in some ways are going right through the roof. That's true. We've mixed up a, a, a number of functions in higher education, and we need to separate those out if we're going to fix this cost problem. Part of the problem, Charles, is the difference between an education and occupational training. Universities were not designed for occupational training. They were designed for to your ability to learn, which is absolutely required, but not necessarily a subject content that you were going to go out and use unless you were some of the uh, applications such as a doctor, dentist, lawyer, some of the professional parts. But that was not the purpose of a university. Today, at least in North America or the specific United States, it's perceived as you have to go there before you get a job. That worked when corporations then took and trained you. They don't do that anymore. They have just cut that right out. So you're you're left where you're really unemployable because you have no skills, but you, you have the ability to learn, but nobody's – and there's the problem. Whereas in other places, you, you're put into an some level of occupational training and you have a skill set. And I think we need to differentiate uh, between like soft skills and hard skills that um, the, this, the conventional higher education, you know, bachelor's degree, even in biology or, or the technical fields, um, you're, you're given a certain set of, of hard skills, uh, knowledge of biology or, or IT, but we don't really teach the soft skills of collaboration, of, of, of a lifetime of learning, of, of there's a, and those kinds of skills that I consider entrepreneurial, we completely ignore. And so those are the skills that are needed in the emerging economy. So just, just having um, a bunch of science, technology, engineering, and, and math graduates, that doesn't fix the economy by itself. It's a good basis, but you also need to teach these soft skills of entrepreneurial um, understanding of how the economy works. The nature of work is changing and people are going to be more and more responsible for creating their own work. Vis-a-vis -vis you're seeing with the internet, people are fashioning all sorts of new approaches and new careers and people that are already doing well are using, capitalizing on the internet, but are not learning um, all of the skills they're learning uh, from a university. I mean, some programming skills, they're learning it in the, in the real world. For those that are in that area, but there's so many people that aren't in that area and they're just they're not, they're, the work is not there. So they've got to be entrepreneurial to create new solutions and new approaches. That's where the education's got to be really focused on. And, and as you said, the soft skills of groups, working with groups, participating, trying to figure out how to bring groups together, whether joint ventures or partnerships or alliances that you can leverage up resources. And there's two other problems with the current model, uh, Gordon, in, in my view. One is that um, we, we now have the technology that could adapt the whole process of teaching to each student's uh, predilections and uh, preferences. And so we have this model, which is a very passive, you know, that there's 200 kids sitting in a room and there's um, some teacher droning on and they read the same textbooks and, and take the same tests. And, and it's, um, it's very much a factory model that uh, 10 million students can all have the same text and hear some variation of the same lecture, whether it appeals to them or whether it actually helps them learn the material or not. Where all modern technology, uh, which they call adaptive learning, every student could have um, software that, that um, gets feedback from them, tests them constantly, and, and chooses the material and the pace that works for that student. So this whole factory model of millions of kids sitting in lecture halls listening to um, oral lectures just makes no sense when we have the technology to do a much better job. And um, the other thing is we, we accredit the, the institution instead of the student. And what we really need to do is accredit the student because 
studies have found, in fact, Google did a study that, that uh, high grades and high test scores have virtually no correlation to um, quality uh, work and, and functioning in the workplace. And uh, being an effective worker and manager had absolutely nothing to do with your test scores or, you know, your grades in, in university classes. So just as we, we uh, accredit uh, doctors and, uh, and architects and the professions by, by testing their knowledge and mastery of critical skills, well, the technology exists to do that for every student. And then, the, then in potential employers would really know what they're getting when they, because a student would have, would have showed that they've mastered these essential skills via objective tests. Whereas nowadays, if you, somebody gives a degree and, and it means they got C minuses in a certain number of courses, the employer has no idea if they actually know anything of, of value in the workplace. Charles, a, a slightly different orthogonal point to this is the employers themselves are expecting people to come fully trained. And that's never been the way. Corporations used to invest and train people that came in. They had the ability to learn and they took the tra- and formal training system in the vast majority of the companies. They have disassembled those and are not doing that. They go out, and, as we were talking earlier, and steal from others, hoping that they've got the skills. One of the reasons they do that is the re- job requirements or the skill set is changing so quickly. People by nature of technology are being obsoleted with the skill sets that they have. Or you just go out and you get a contractor or you get an outsource of somebody who's got that skill at this point in time and you use it. So the educational system, it's its more than just the formal post-secondary schooling and what it's preparing. It, it's, it's an overlap into the job, the work world itself and their investment. And they used to work sort of well together. Today, they don't at all. So what's happening in North America Companies are saying, I can't find the skills, and they're going to other places where there's a more focused occupational training skill set that's been put in place. Well, Gordon, we uh, before the programs, uh, we were discussing our own personal experience, and um, it, it seems that you actually ha- had um, an excellent education in, in, um, in college that put you in uh, eight workplaces. And so, and that's, why don't you describe that? Because that's, I think, the, the solution to bring education into the, the actual living, breathing workplace. My undergraduate was in engineering, aeronautical engineering. It took me five years to get an engineering degree, which is a four-year honors degree. And the reason it took me five years is we went to school year-round, nonstop, <laughs> the odd day off, it seemed. But it was four months on, four months off, so that you ended up with eight different work terms. So... When I was going out in onto my work terms, I was working on de, in design boards, circuit boards, uh, mechanical layout, turbine blades, etc. So that when you, when you went back to the classrooms, and you, even the student population in the classroom who were, had all sorts of different types of work terms than I had just had, the the discussion with the professors was just so much different because they had real world experience. In many cases, the professors had no place to hide because they themselves were were dated. There was a sense of how you applied it because you needed that for your next your next work term. And I contrast those who went to other skills, like in, in I was out of Canada, that went to McGill that were graduating and they were coming out and they just had some basic courses that they'd been able to study, memorize and pass. But now the companies had to decide to train them. They weren't prepared. And this is this link that you have to have. And it's not, I'm not relating it personally. This was 40 years ago. And, and many of these are now standard practices, um, for, for some of the occupations, but it needs to be a lot more integrated occupational training. If your goal here is to prepare people for jobs versus just trying to give them a, a broadened ed- education. And that's where we're letting ourselves down. So more, more apprenticeship, more training. And I think, Charles, to some degree, this is where this whole internship that's now evolving, corporations are trying to get out from under training obligations, but they're not and not paying the cost, but are figuring that this is the, the medium that they can strike, trying to get people to work for nothing to get it on their CV, but postgraduate. What I see very clearly, Gordon, is that um, a four-year bachelor's degree education should cost and could cost in the neighborhood of three to $4,000 not a hundred thousand or hundred and fifty thousand or two hundred thousand. Now that of course doesn't count 
uh, you know, food and transport and uh, living expenses, but we should be able to provide a superior education for less than $5,000 that would include um, this kind of work terms in the workplace. And the classes are not taught by tenured professors earning $120,000 a year. They're taught by working professionals in the field, in the workplace. Well, in many ways, the roles of community colleges and junior colleges and technical colleges really try and address that uh, to some degree. And they need to be expanded in huge fashion, in my mind, with a lot of more effective online education integrated in it to drive the, the cost down. But part of it is a cultural attitude that we have, that there's this sense of prestige and that's standing in our way, but the, because the realities are today, a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars worth of this education no longer pays, as you point out. It doesn't. But the time that you will spend in interns and then trying to get ahead, you, you're look at Obama said he's the first president in history was running for president, paying off his student loans, and he had a Harvard Law degree. <laughs> so um, it, it's just cost prohibitive. People and the kids today are saying it's not worth it. And now, now they're totally unemployable. It's entirely possible that we could devote um, higher education and realign it with what I call the emerging economy, the parts of the economy that are prospering. And what that, what that part of the economy values is entrepreneurial skills, lifetime learning, being able to adapt to uh, and combine different fields, collaborate effectively with other people, both in person and uh, remotely. These skills are are imminently teachable, and uh, you and I, who've who've hired people, who've run our own firms or divisions, that's the kind of person we want. And that person doesn't just um, appear out of a vacuum. That those skills have to be taught and practiced just as much as carpentry or programming. Exactly. And, and that's what I would like to see. And I think it's entirely possible with the technology that we now have to support that point. Look at how many people on the internet are making huge fortunes. They're very young, very adaptive, and they're creative, and they're entrepreneurial. But you go through and you look at the legends. Um, they started in college, and I'm not picking on, on college, but college wasn't fulfilling a role. Bill Gates never finished. Michael Dell never finished. Um, Steve Jobs never finished. Uh, Larry Ellison never finished. I, I just keep on going. And, and, and the reason they all dropped out it wasn't fulfilling a need, but what they had, and it wasn't because they got a great technical education at college. They had this burning passion. They were able to learn. They were entrepreneurial. They were able to put people around them, and, and, and they were driven. And they cr literally, literally created industries. Now, everybody's not going to be a Larry Ellison or a Bill Gates, but that element is at the core today of what needs to be brought out in education because people are going to have to create their own work. You know, my grandfather's days, you didn't aspire to go out and get employed by somebody. He he would to him it was like he would shake his head. It was the lazy person that went and got a job. To him you went out and you found work and you created work. And so companies back then were were called Charles Smith and Sons. You created it and yet if you brought your son in and you trained it, but there was this entrepreneur maybe it was just a desperation and survival but that that was the way it was but as we urbanized and people then industrialized went to cities expecting to find a job that's changed the jobs aren't there and you look at what's happening in the cities where the work work is not there so you're going to have to have the skills to go and create the work and it will always be there charles find a need and fill it that's right charles we have to wrap here Key messages you'd like to leave with the listeners on your book and um, and how they could order it? Please visit me at uh, www.of2minds.com and you can uh, read the first chapter of the book um, by just uh, clicking on the links there. And I would emphasize um, that my message is positive, that I think we could dramatically drop the, the cost of education while dramatically improving it and we can start teaching young people how to create value and create jobs for themselves, as as Gordon said. Yeah, Charles, I apologize if some of my comments this morning have been negative because your book is very, very positive. And, and it is really a positive story here because there's so much opportunity if we could just shift our attitudes towards education and shift these issues with model, culture. We never got into it in funding and how it's even 
massive issues with how it's, it's funded right now today. But the opportunities are, are just there in a huge way to, to really reinvent America and reinvent a lot of the developed countries who have superb educational infrastructures in place. They're just not pointed correctly in my assessment. Got a break. Um, I'm sure we're going to be talking about this subject in many, from many different facets throughout the course of the year, and it's always a lot of fun. Charles, till we get a chance to talk again, all the best. Thank you. Talk to you. Bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.